Good afternoon, Metro. Welcome to another version of our Facebook Live. Thanks for joining with us today. Uh, we're looking forward to having a nice conversation. Uh, me and my friends up here today, Pastor David, uh, Pastor of Spiritual Formation here at Metro, Pastor Ansi, our uh, Pastor of Student Ministries, myself, uh, Kevin, Pastor of, um, what? executing things, uh, <laughs> executive pastor, and then Pastor Sunita, our, uh, our newest member of staff, uh, pastor of our Justice, Advocacy, and Compassion Ministries, and executive director of the Community Center. Uh, we've got a list of questions that a lot of you sent in already, so thank you for doing that. Uh, let me just tell you right now, you sent in more than we could ever possibly address in the time allotted to us. Uh, we've, we've edited some of them and combined them uh, where they were similar, so hopefully you'll get the the response that uh, that you're looking for. And also, if your question doesn't get addressed today, um, don't ever hesitate to just seek one of us out on Sunday. We really don't mind that at all. If we don't know the answer, we'd love to point you to uh, where you could find that answer. Uh, so we're gonna jump right into it here. I've asked Pastor Sunita to take the first one, and the first couple of questions are related to what's going on in our country uh, right now. So this is kind of real-time stuff that we're, uh, we're gonna be addressing here. So here's the first question and uh, Pastor Sunita will uh, respond. How can we as Christians respond to the violence and terrorism in Charlottesville and beyond? Um, thank you, so good afternoon everyone. Um, and it's a great question and it's a timely question, unfortunately. Um, I think first and foremost, we are called as Christians to name um, what's happening in our society. Um, and we have vocabulary for it in the Bible and um, you know, we have to name these powers and principalities, the, the racism that we're seeing, the homophobia, the anti-Semitism, um, in all its forms and in, in every way that it, um, that it appears, um, first and foremost, we have to call it and name it as what it is. Um, and we can't be afraid to do so. Um, so first we have to name it. Um, I think we understand from that, that um, we combat this spiritually as well as um, sort of physically. You know, the Bible talks about um, having to pray, and we really cannot discount the power of prayer um, because, um, as the Bible says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, and that's what this is. Um, it's, a, it's a spirit it's a, um, that has infected our country, um, and, it, and it manifests itself, um, unfortunately, in people, in institutions, um, and, and we saw it on the streets of Charlottesville, um, where you know a person can drive their car into a crowd um, and kill someone um, with no remorse, and the people around them would um, support that. So um, we certainly have to be prayerf prayerful about it. But I also think that we have to um, decide for ourselves that we're not going to be a reactionary people and that we start to build alliances with other um, faith groups and, um, and even for ourselves before these things happen and in between these situations where we're constantly having the conversation about what can we do, who can um, we um, partner ourselves with, who can we build alliances with so that when these things do happen, um, that we have a response ready and, and available, that we're not always in reaction mode, but that we're proactively um, talking about how we love one another, that we're proactively teaching our children how to love one another, and that we're constantly reevaluating ourselves um, in our private conversations with people. And then lastly, what I would say is that we also have to remind ourselves that um, we have the gospel message. We have the message of peace. We have, we've been called ministers of reconciliation. It is our job to give that message. And unfortunately, if the, the church is silent, then other people um, come in to fill that void, but they don't come with the power that the gospel brings. Um, our, Jesus is our reconciler. Um, Jesus is um, love. God is love. Um, Jesus is the one who talks about the kingdom of God coming to earth and, and that there's justice and there's compassion for the oppressed. Um, and we have that message. And unfortunately, when the church remains silent, um, others fill that void um, with, with, in my opinion, um, something that they cannot accomplish without the power of Jesus Christ. Good, I, I appreciate that very much. Um, 
I'd, I'd like to just sort of tap in on what you said in terms of silence, because I think a, for a lot of us, silence is our comfort zone at times like this. It, it really doesn't affect me. I don't know anybody there. Um, and that really should not be an option for the church. We, we need to find our voice at times like this, even if our voice is asking questions. Uh, we need to stand in solidarity uh, with those who are more directly impacted, and that only happens when we are willing uh, to use our voice and to, to express our own opinions, uh, whatever they may be. So, yeah, silence, not an option for us. The second question is, is, is related, and uh, Pastor Ancy's going to field this one. Uh, some people get offended when the church gets involved with what they regard as political issues. For example, Black Lives Matter or what's just happened in Charlottesville or other situations. How do we draw the line between appropriate and inappropriate commentary on issues that are entangled in politics? So this is a, a very great question, and I think um, the answer to that is there should be our beliefs and our, our faith should really impact how we interact with the world. Uh, and so if it's not, that's an issue. Like we can't compartmentalize what we believe and how we interact with the world. And so um, if you're a Christian and your beliefs are this, you need to have commentary on what is going on in the world, the things that are impacting you and the people around you and your community and your government. And if that's not uh, part of something that your faith is impacting, then what is the purpose of faith? Um, I would question if you were um, those that think of uh, church and secular as two separate things. Um, if that's um, if that's not um, where your faith is not part of who you are, then um, because you really need to walk in who you are in all parts. Um, I I would hope that I'm the same person I'm in church as I am. Uh, when I walk in the streets or when I'm with my family. And I know that's not always possible. I know that we, um, in moments in church, we can be a little bit, um, uh, we can feel that we're closer to God and we can um, react to things a little differently. But but we want to make sure that the, the way we um, respond to things is in line with what God's teaching. And we need to uh, to really look at those things in, the, in politics with the word, right? How, what does God say about how we should treat people and how we should, uh, what does he say? about who people are and how we react to, um, to governments and, and policies and how we vote, um, those things have to be impacted by our beliefs. And so if we are, if those um, are impacting our beliefs, then we need to let that be a commentary in church uh, because church is part of who we are. Um. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Ancy, for that. Um, let me just remind you that you can send in your questions uh, live anytime you want. We've got folks that are uh, ready to receive those, and they'll pass those on to us up here. I haven't seen any yet. Uh, so we're going to move on to the next topic. If you do have a question related to what uh, either Pastor Sunita or Pastor Ansi just addressed, feel free to send it in, and we'll see if we can get to that. Uh, but Pastor David, somebody sent in a question uh, regarding evolution, and they asked, what is Metro's stance on evolution? Okay. Well, as far as I know, and I stand ready to be corrected, Metro or the ECC does not have an official position on, on evolution. But um, here are some fundamentals on which we agree. We believe that based on the natural revelation of creation and the special revelation of scripture, that there is one infinite uncaused cause that we call God. We also recognize that um, as the scripture begins in Genesis 1, 1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So we believe that God is the author and initiator of creation. It states that God created the heaven and the earth, not specifically how in terms of the scientific uh, details. Uh, and even then, too, um, there is um, <coughs> disagreement uh, among Christians regarding how we even interpret um, Genesis 1 and 2. So some believe that it is a literal 12-day, 24-hour day account. There are others who believe, for example, in the gap theory, that there's a gap between verse 1 and 2, and the earth not was null and void, but became null and void with a great cataclysm. Also, there, there's, there's another strong view that holds that the word day. Welcome back, Metro. We've uh, been on an adventure since we last spoke with you. We've actually changed our venue 
Uh, we're now broadcasting live from Battery Park in Manhattan. <laughs> no, just kidding. We moved into my office, uh, see if we could get a stronger signal, and apparently it's working better now. The technical guys are giving us the thumbs up there. So once again, I will pass this off to my colleague, Pastor David, in terms of uh, the question on evolution. Okay, so after yet another gap in our <laughs> podcast, we uh, summarize the gap theory where there are some Christians who believe that between verses 1 and 2 of Genesis there is a gap. There is some great cataclysm, which some interpret as the, war, the rebellion and war in heaven. And so not the earth was null and void, but the earth became null and void. Uh, another very popular theory is that the use of the word yom in Hebrew, which means um, day, is not to necessarily be interpreted in a 12 or 24 hour day. So is, for example, the context in the day that the Lord created the heaven and the earth. So here is something that at six periods of time, not necessarily a short 24 hour day. And then there are others who hold to what we call the framework hypothesis, which basically sees it not so much as a strictly literal document, but a literary document in terms of describing how, how creation uh, took place. So, you know, there, there are differences in terms of even just how Christians interpret uh, the book of Genesis. Um, I think, too, that um, it is fairly easy for us to agree on issues of microevolution in terms of variations of, uh, within the species based on environment and on different conditions. I think one of the challenges is the whole issue of, of macroevolution. So how do you move from an invertebrate to a vertebrate? And so um, even scientists would, would agree that there, there are challenges, and um, even if we take into consideration long periods of time and probability, that there are challenges with the whole issue of, of, of evolution. Uh, there are some Christians who actually hold to what we call a hybrid view which is um, theistic or God-directed evolution. So basically, they see God directing the whole process of the evolving of the species. So, you know, these are kind of some of the um, issues that we deal with. Uh, we must confess that um, our knowledge is limited and finite, mm. and therefore we need to approach this whole issue with, with humility, knowing that we don't have answers to all the questions. Mm. Wow, very good, David. Thank you for that. Um, I'm, I'm sure for a lot of you, there's, there's, there's more questions along that same line, and uh, I, I would encourage you to pursue those. There's lots of good books that have been written on the subject. And uh, yeah, thank you for whoever sent that question in. Uh, given the fact that our time has, has slipped away from us a bit here, I'm gonna drop down to a question that I think kind of has universal appeal uh, that one of you asked. It's, it's regarding how do I know God's will for my life? And for any of us that are, that are serving as pastors, uh, we have sat across the table with many people who have had that question and, and we've had the opportunity to, to speak into their lives. So what I'm gonna do with this one, I'm gonna, open it up to all four of us. Um, I'll be happy to launch this one, but I think it'll be good for you to hear from each of the pastors on this one because there are, there are a lot of nuances in terms of uh, knowing what God's will is for our life. And I just want to start off by saying that I believe that uh, sometimes it's easy for us as Christians to have um, an incorrect view of what God's will for my life means. Uh, there are, there are, a couple of rare occasions in Scripture, like the Apostle Paul, uh, when he received uh, his call to ministry on the Damascus Road, or Moses, when he had a personal conversation with God. And we can tend to look at those events in those individuals' lives and, and think that's what we should be waiting for, hoping for, praying for, in terms of God revealing his will for us. And, and I think that that's kind of setting us up for disappointment. Uh, given the fact that God has revealed so much to us in his word, uh, intending for us to pay attention to it, and his desire is that as we learn his word, we learn more about what his will is for us. And uh, I personally believe that scripture paints a picture of a God who gives us a tremendous amount of freedom. He gives us guidelines, he gives us constraints, but within those guidelines and constraints, 
he gives us a lot of freedom. And I believe that it's up to each individual to, number one, discover how God uniquely made us. And, and we believe that here at Metro to the point where we actually offer a, a course. Pastor David uh, leads a course called Shape to help us know what, what is our spiritual gifting? How has God, God wired us? And then we become stewards of that knowledge, and, and we need to apply what God has poured into us in, in service of others. Um, the, the other aspect that I'll mention before I, I sign off here is that uh, God makes his general will uh, available to us. He reveals it to all of us as he gives us guidance for living. And both the Old and New Testament are full of good guidance for living. And, and these help define the constraints that God wants us to live within. We should always be seeking to love God with everything that's in us. That's his will for us. God's will for us is that we pray. And he makes that evident throughout scripture in, in, in terms of even mandating that his followers are people that engage in prayer. It shouldn't be optional for any of us. Uh, we're told to love one another. That's those of us within the church. We're told to love our neighbor. That's anybody who needs a neighbor. And so there's all kinds of aspects of God's general will for all of his children that are available to us in the scripture. And sometimes I think our, our pursuit should be more in those directions rather than waiting for that specific call from God that knocks us down uh, as we're traveling on the road and has him tell us that he wants us to do some some amazing things. So I'll, I'll start with that and then uh, hand it off maybe to Pastor Sunita. She hasn't spoken for a moment. Okay. Um, so I, I agree with Pastor Kevin in a lot of ways. Um, I think there was, there was like the macro will, all the things that all of us as Christians should be doing. Um, and then there's those things that God has called us specifically to do each individual, and I think that's where people wrestle the most. Um, you know, the first thing I'll tell you is that you have to be patient. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, you know, there is a, there is a, um, there is an agitation almost um, within some of us that we don't feel like we are doing enough unless we know definitively what God has called us to do. And unfortunately, we look at other people who have a very specific calling, and we say that um you know i want to be like them um and i and mm. and i and i it's almost i almost feel weighted in this conversation because all of us have a specific call at least at some in some portion of our lives to be pastors right but most people aren't called to be pastors um you might be called to be a really great mother um and you're mothering your children and you're mothering other children in the community and god has called you to um invest in the lives of single women who might need extra help or to um to you know to grandmother um so i think when we when we think about god's will we have to also be careful that we're not putting god in a box about what that will might look like for our lives and it really um comes with spending a lot of time discerning our gifts that god has given us also understanding that our the God's will might change in different seasons of our lives. Um, and I also think it, um, you know, one of the things that um, makes it difficult, and I know this is not giving a clear answer necessarily, is that there's a difference between doing and being. And I think God calls us more to be than to do. And a lot of us, myself included, have a tendency to want to do. Um, and unless I'm doing something, I don't feel like I'm fulfilling what God um, has, you know, purposed me for. And sometimes God's will is for you just to be, to be with him, to be with other people, to, mm -hmm. um, you know, to be his presence in situations. Um, and so I think, you know, you may have a specific calling where God is telling you to go be a missionary, go, you know, be a an IT uh, person at a nonprofit, or um, or maybe God is calling you to be His presence wherever you are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and and I think for some of us, it's it's getting over the the box that I have to have something to to write next to my name in order to feel as though I'm I'm purposed by God. Well, you know, there's this misunderstanding regarding this mysterious will of God. And when we think of the will of God, we think, well, God, what college do you want me to attend? Mm -hmm. Who do you want me to marry? What profession do I take? But as you guys have mentioned, 90% um, of the will of God is already revealed in his word. Mm -hmm. And so our responsibility is actually to get familiar with the will of God in the word 
and to hear it and to gladly obey it uh, immediately. So that's it. But um, you know, I think of some guidelines regarding how we receive guidance in decision making. And uh, Paul Little, in one of his urban address, um, gave about four or five um, guidelines as to how to determine or affirm the will of God. One was, you know, scripture. As we read scripture, sometimes um, the passages that we read are somewhat aligned with our situation, uh, where God speaks to us. The other aspect is prayer, as we respond to God. Uh, the third aspect is is God the counsel. So we have people who know us and who can give some sort of objective perspective, um, ask us the right questions, give us the right input that helps to make that decision easier. And then the, the, the fourth aspect, which is a little bit trickier because sometimes we can set up an experiment to get the desired results, circumstances. <laughs> but sometimes there's just some unusual circumstances that transpire and you, we take notice and somehow through these unusual circumstances, God may be speaking to us. And, and then finally, just, just the inner peace that the Holy Spirit gives. That um, even though you're not 100% sure that this is the way that God wants me to go, and um, should it not be the way, then he will direct me otherwise. But I think underlying all of that is the fact of who do we believe God is and what our relationship is with him. Uh, Romans 8.32 um, talks about God, he that spared not his own son, but freely gave him for us all. How, we, how will he not with him freely give us all things? So, you know, God is not the stern, meaning um, father who, you know, wants to withhold things from us. But like you, if you're a parent, or if you conceive of yourself as a parent, you would want to give your child the very best. And God wants to give us the very best. Huh. Yeah, I agree with all of you. And for me, like 90% is in the Word, but also there's a part of getting to know who, how God made you and understanding uh, more about yourself and more about people uh, because the image of God is in us, right? As we understand ourselves and people more and how we build relationships and community, we understand God more. And as we understand God more and we spend more time with God, I think He directs us, you know? not uh, It's not these uh, big moments, it's these confirmations that come Come in as we're going along, as we do the things, you know, um, he'll confirm or he'll say, you'll get the feeling that maybe this is not the right way. But I think God um, walks with us in everything we do. We don't always have to um, discern um, the exact will and then follow. Sometimes you just walk and then God guides you as we're walking. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. And thanks for that question. Uh, it's one that I think should be important to all of us. Keeping my eye on the clock here, we're, we're not going to go past 1.30 today, so I want to try to get in a couple more here. Um, I'm going to ask Pastor Sunita to weigh in on, on this one. Uh, the question that you asked is this, is there a place for LGBTQ people in the church? What is the church's stance on LGBTQ rights? What if you have good friends that are part of this community? Okay. So um, I think um, there's a place for um, people who identify as LGBTQ um, in church because there's a place for all of us in church. Mm -hmm. um, I think that um, the Bible is, is, um, is clear that we are all sinners saved by grace. And um, if our message is to be one of reconciliation, our message is to be one of compassion, our message is to be one of, na of, of loving, of being a neighbor to those who need a neighbor, then um, we have to be clear that um, even though it is not God's design that, um, that we are in homosexual relationships, that there is a, there is room for people who are wrestling with their sexuality and there's room for people who um, may have settled on their sexuality um, and and we as Christians have to be an extension of God's grace mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the worst thing we can do is to push someone away from the church because Oftentimes when people see us, they see us as representatives of God. And when we push them away, 
it's almost as if God has pushed them away. Um, and and that to me is um, is the exact opposite of what Christ would have us to mm-hmm. do. Yeah, and let me just add up the, the last part of that question there regarding what if you have good friends that are part of this community? Well, I would say start by celebrating that. Rejoice in the fact that you do have good friends in this community, which means that you are a loving person uh, and, and apparently somebody who, um, who f- these folks would feel safe with. Uh, that may be the closest to church that some of them ever get. Uh, because it, it is it is difficult um, for a lot of our LGBTQ friends to be comfortable in church and find a church where uh, they can really have their needs ministered to. So definitely uh, em- embrace that relationship. You can be great friends with somebody without um, agreeing with everything that they have decided on. I think every friendship holds holds those dynamics. So, um, yeah, I would, I would cherish that situation. Uh, I personally am not in that situation right now. I have been in the past, but uh, I would just encourage you in that. Uh, next question that I want us to touch on here uh, for Pastor Ansi. Uh, one of you asked a question. Uh, you said, my, my mother-in-law is Buddhist. We are Christian, and sometimes she leaves small Buddhist tokens of prayer protection in our home without our knowledge, or she prays Buddhist prayers over our baby while she's with her. We've had conversations about it. She usually apologizes, but it still really bothers me. Are there spiritual ramifications for allowing someone to practice Buddhism on your family? Well, that's a great question. I, um, you know, there is spiritual ramification because prayer um, is powerful, right? Prayer is powerful, um, but but here is an opportunity for you. Um, for me, this would be an opportunity. I would um, definitely. There are things you need to do. Maybe pray protection over your home, over your children. Uh, provide, uh, you know, pray cleansing. But also, um, if you're talking to your mother-in-law or your family member, and they're not, um, they're not going to change because this is their belief. Here's the thing. They believe that they are providing protection for your child, and so you can't. You're not going to change that belief. But if she is, uh, you ha- you continue to have that conversation. But if she is continuing to do that, then here's an opportunity for you to say, well, okay, then this is happening. But how can can I pray for you? Because if you are you have this belief, but I have this belief. We're Christians. I'd love to pray for you. I love you. Are opening up God to this person. Mm. You know, you can mm. um, you can protect your family. God, you know. God is bigger than Buddhism and any tokens or anything. You can pro- you can protect your family. You can cleanse it. As your child grows older, you can teach them about what these tokens and things mean and, and what we believe as Christians and what what they and and how to protect themselves. But but here is an opportunity to show love because. Um, as I know with my own having grandparents with children, you can't stop them from giving candy to your children. You're not going to help. You're not going to stop them from practicing their faith, but you can expose them to your faith. You can be loving. You can be inviting. You can your love and your um, willingness to walk in that with them. Um, maybe what's going to take them and help them journey and ask. Maybe they will ask questions. Maybe they will want to know why you believe what you do, and that may be the one opening. You may be the one that brings God, you know, Jesus to them. And so any opportunity to bring God and the gospel and love, I would say that's a win. Uh, so instead of being uh, so upset about it, I would be very upset, but in the moment, step back and say, hey God, how can we use this to glorify you? How can we reach my family member for you? How can I protect my family, but also remember that uh, ultimately you love all people and we want all people for the kingdom. So what do we, can we do? That's a great redemptive response. I like that. (laughs) Very good. Um, I apologize to those of you whose questions didn't get addressed today. Um, It looks like we did get the technology cleared up here, but we we definitely missed a chunk of our time. I'm going to ask Pastor David to respond to the last one. This is one that came in right near the end today, Uh, and it's something that affects a lot of us. I know it it affects my wife and myself because the question is about miscarriages. For those of us that have ever lost a, a child to a miscarriage, And it says this, um, are these lost pregnancies, these unborn children, still considered a soul? Meaning, will they go to heaven? Well, this is not certainly um, just a theological question. Sometimes it comes out of the grief and pain 
And um, last year we had to mourn with some friends who delivered a, a stillborn child. Uh, thankfully, as they went through grief counseling, um, they got pregnant again, and two weeks ago um, they gave birth to uh, a child. Um, there are some things on which scripture is very clear and explicit, and there are some things on which scripture is silent. And we should not try to add to scripture what is not already there. Perhaps the only text I can think of uh, regarding the soul and the immortality of an infant is after David, King David has this adulterous relationship with Bathsheba. The son is born and the son dies. And um, as David declares after he gets over it, he said in Second Samuel 12, I believe, um, he will not come to me, but I will go to him. Mm -hmm. And so that seems to be the only little glimmer that, that we get in scripture. Mm -hmm. And so regardless of whatever church tradition uh, we have or whatever else, I think uh, we just need to say that we don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and that maybe um, people who have lost their children, either in um, stillborn or in miscarriages, maybe they'll have the surprise of seeing that child and being able to identify the child that they may have given the name, but we don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but we know that God is a good God and He will do what's right. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Great note to end on. Uh, thank you for those of you who joined us today. Um, we're going to do this again. Uh, this is not the last time. We're going to keep working on the technical stuff. And uh, we're going to solicit your questions because uh, we really do want to answer them for you as best we can. So God bless you all. Have a, a great rest of the week. We'll look forward to seeing you on Sunday. So long. <laughs>